Welcome back, baseball fans, to the 1979-82 League World Series wrap-up and year review with stats. It's all over. Uh, we saw that end a week ago. The Expos winning the World Series over the Phillies in dominant fashion, a four-game sweep. And when you look at an overview now, you see that they were indeed the number one team in American League with 30 wins, 698 baseball. And even in the American League, uh, there really wasn't anybody close. I guess the Angels, who were the runner-up in the League Championship Series. Um, and again, what, the reason why it's very rare to see a, a team, you know, play over 667 ball is because there's so much uh, competition within division. And the schedule is 90% division. So the Brewers and Royals were knocking heads, and the Angels... Had you know the A's and Rangers both played them well. Of course, America League East, the Yankees and Orioles are slugging it out. And the Expos really uh, took it on those two teams down there. They would beat the Phillies in the World Series. The Phillies finished the year 26 and 20. The Reds were the best team, but the Phillies knocked those Reds out, of course. And they did that by in the game five. Uh, Tom Seaver and the Reds at Riverfront Stadium had a 6-1 lead in the seventh inning. And then the Phillies then got 13 hits in the next 22 plate appearances and got six runs in the last three innings. Stunning the Reds. So they got all that offense. And then when the Phillies opened the uh, League Championship Series against Portland, they lost 1-0 in 11 innings. It's a very streaky Philadelphia team, and they just got struck again with a bad streak in the World Series. So with that, uh, let's take a look. Before we get to stats, I just want to kind of look at the end of the line here. So, so yeah, here's the World Series. It was just four games. Expos win it four games to zero. And then after, you know, after that, there's just a bunch of empty boxes to show the leagues uh, over for the year. Going back on these Expos, um, the previous series, it took them seven games against the Angels. The previous series, it took them five games versus the Yankees after getting a bye. So it shows that it showed that this team, you know, they were hard nosed. They won tight games, but they also blew out the Phillies, as it turns out. And this is, of course, the pitching rotations for that series. We'll shut that down for a moment. And now we want to get into the World Series uh, box. The World Series uh, stats. Um, let's start. Let's start with the Phillies, the runners-up, and you'll see what happened here. So, first thing I look at is, oh, the Phillies—they hit 301. That's great. Four games. They didn't win though. They scored 17 runs. They gave up 32. That's not good. Um, Keith Moreland, don't blame him. I know. He was the catcher that got pulled because Tim Raines was stealing bases on him. He was only hitting 600. And don't blame Pete Rose either at 444. Again, this team hit 301, so the usual suspects were contributing. However, interesting to note, Mr. Michael Jack Schmidt struggled. One of his worst postseason series ever with an 81 card, and I've used that card frequently in mixed card leagues, and it always dominates, and this time... It finally fell. He got into a slump at the worst time. A 118, a 2 for 17 with no home runs and one RBI in just four games. Yep, you'd have to imagine that if they had three or four more games, he'd start getting back to his old self. But real bad series for Mike Schmidt. We still have his card for two more years in this timeline. In the pitching, let's start with the good. Ray Searage <laughs> situationally did an outstanding job. Three and a third scoreless innings. As a matchup lefty uh, coming in uh, against the bottom of the Expo lineup. Uh, Eric Schall had a good start, uh, five and a third innings. Uh, Roy Thomas out of the bullpen, uh, out of the bullpen wasn't very special. Ray Burris' start wasn't very good. And then we get down here. Before we get to down here, I guess I should mention that poor Dick Ruthven just had to watch this whole thing. He was a game five starter, didn't play. But here it is, folks. You tell me. Okay, we have the 1980 Steve Carlton and Tug McGraw cards. 
we know what happens. Mag uh, Carlton wins 24 games. McGraw uh, has a 147 ERA, and he's on the mound in Game 6 of that World Series against Kansas City Royals. Carlton, two starts, just got knocked around. Hope I mean, hopelessly. This is hor horrendous. I don't care who you are. Um, this probably goes to show you that the Expos were just banging their own cards and the few things that are on these pitchers' cards. But I, it's going to be hard to find four days in baseball history where Steve Carlton and Tom McGraw were this bad. And this is this is what just happened. A 7.20 team ERA. Expos are averaging 7.2 earned runs per contest and just demolished the Phillies. So let's go take a look at those Expos. See how great their thing turned out. Let's start up top. They're hitting 333. The 32 runs scored to 17 given up. Um, the series MVP, we gave it to Andre Dawson. You could give it to Larry Parrish. Probably could give it to Al Oliver. Well, maybe not Al Oliver. He didn't have to do too much. Oh, he did. You probably give it to the, uh, Dan Norman's clutch hits or Rich Murray's clutch hits. Where's Rich Murray? There's Rich Murray. But Dawson seemed to be the guy who... Interestingly, he he had the double A speed like Reigns, but also the average in production of a Parish, and he had three homers and two doubles. And yeah, Larry Parish hit five twenty nine, Dawson hits uh, four seventy one. So yeah, co MVPs, I don't care, whatever. I had to give it to somebody. Give it to Dawson. It doesn't really matter. Uh, yeah, they just wrecked everything. Eddie, and you know a lot of this Rich Murray is late in game off of Tub McGraw. There's a 500 batting average and 12 trips. Dan Norman against left-handed pitching, 286 with two big hits. A big triple that uh, gave them the lead in game four. Um, uh, you see, Tim Raines only had four stolen bases, but they all happened in the first two games. So after those first two games, they switched to Bob Boone. And when they switched to Bob Boone, it slowed things down, but it did not slow the Expos down. We'll go take a look at their pitching staff. A 389 ERA, which is more than enough when you're scoring seven. Um, and funny part about this, let's look at the line of Bill Gullickson. So in a four-game series, it just it was his turn in the rotation that he got the starts in games one and four because Steve Rogers did not have enough time, uh, enough rest before the game one. So Gullickson's two starts, he gets the two wins. But look at he pitched 13 innings. 23 hits allowed, a 5.54 ERA and a 2.15 WHIP. Very bizarre, but he'll take them. I, yeah, no one's going to take those wins away from Gullickson. He's got two of the four World Series wins. Rogers start though, eight me. solid, you know, eight great innings for Steve Rogers. And really, it was the bullpen not blowing it is the key here. Um, you know, actually Lyle was a setup guy and he got the save in game four. And Sosa went two and a third innings to get his save. And uh, see, this makes up for, you know, the mistakes that happened in the Philadelphia bullpen, of course with, with McGraw, but also with Roy Thomas and Dick Drago. Everybody gave up runs besides Searage. So that's the World Series in a nutshell. And we saw the overall standings. We could take a look at stats here. And, um, these are team stats. Let's go. Yeah, let's go look at each team's year to date. Well, let's start with the uh, Phillies, the runners up here. I'm not going to go through the entire league's team stats. I'll just go through the Phillies and the um, Expos. So yeah, here's your Phillies. You know, uh, uh, it's it's a pretty good, um, you know, a pretty good year. We're hitting 295. 428 ERA is a little on the high side. But um, uh, Will Fong, platoon roll, up top there. Herndon, platoon roll, up there. Keith Moreland, everyday roll. He just can't. He's just not a good defensive catcher. And what do you you got to make him a DH or something. Uh, Bob Boone, really overachieved. Um, good for him. Pete Rose hit uh, just slightly under his batting average on his card. Lonnie Smith hit 20 points below his batting average on his card. Schmidt, you know, funny thing is with Schmidty. He really tailed off in that World Series, but he'd already had the MVP sewed up because he led the league in Homer and RBI. Probably was hitting 290 or so before he went 2 for 17 in that World Series. Um, 
Uh, McBride, though, disappointing year. And Boa, again, we just all we cared about was he was a 187 at shortstop, put 241 for the Major League Baseball Phillies. He had 212 for us, but he stole 13 bases, lead the club. Carlton's regular season, seven and four, 390 ERA. Oh, that, that includes the the World Series. That's his, that's his total numbers. So in basically 40% of what how he pitched in 1980, he went seven four, 390 ERA, which is 1.6 runs worse than his ERA. Uh, Eric Shaw was a free agent brought in from the Padres. We thought he'd be a little better than this. And here's McGraw's season. A season where he was awful, and then he had the World Series. So think about that, folks. I mean, you're thinking that he'll turn it around by the time the World Series rolls. Uh-uh. What a calendar year this is. McGraw has been awful the whole time. Look, he's got nine saves. Probably when they have a three-run lead in the ninth. Two and four, nine saves, 25 innings. And ERA is 7.11. His walk-strikeout ratio is good. That's that's good to know. But 7.11. That's unlucky for Tug McGraw. That was terrible. And that's pretty much the Phillies. Just not quite enough pitching to, you know, be a top dog. And let's take a look at your, at the Expos. This is your 30 and 13 year-to-date stats. A 290 team with a 356 ERA. Al Oliver, he is your American League MVP. We give it to Al Oliver. 358 batting average, 413 on base, 13 homers and 36, and 62 hits. Very few categories did he not lead the league in. And if you're thinking, could Al Oliver win an MVP? Yeah, I think it could have happened. It just it didn't with the Pirates or the Texas Rangers. Um, but did he, he? He he probably came close in '82. Maybe he did win the MVP. I can't recall. But what a year he had in 82 with his 22 home runs and a 330 average for the Expo. So he gets rewarded here. Gary Carter really overachieved with the batting average. 11 home or 34 RBI. This is how you win a World Series, folks. Your guys overachieve a little bit. Tim Raines, 32 stolen bases in 43 games. Yeah, that'll get you to 100. We played a full season. Also had three home runs tossed in there. Uh, Dawson, his batting average was only 282, but he did give you 9, 27, and 16 steals, and again, 40 some games. Larry Parrish drove in 32 runs. And you had the stragglers here. You had these, um, this three headed monster, Brian Little, I call them the Rat Pack. Brian Little, um, Doug Flynn, and Mick Kelleher. They're, they're basically all the same guy. That's They're all like, Five nine hundred sixty-five pound middle infielders, and they had three, all three of these guys on the same team, and that was good enough to help them out. Let's look at the pitching. Steve Rogers, boom, there it is. I uh, probably could have got. I forget who we gave a Cy Young to. We'll look at that a little bit later. Um, but very up high on the Cy Young list, as you can imagine. ERA just over three, but look at the WHIP, one hundred six. Your closer's got a nine saves and a whip of 103, 295. How about Bill Gullickson? You know what's interesting? Gullickson was 7 and 9 in 81 with an outstanding card. Didn't give up a lot of homers, didn't give up a lot of walks. Very underrated pitcher. Um, and here his area was a little high, but he did win two World Series games. Your number four starter, seldom used Scott Sanderson, uh, was undefeated. Rudy May, 5 and 2 with a high ERA. Great bullpen again. You know, so that bullpen you saw in the World Series, they delivered in the regular season as well. Got to have a bullpen. Just a, you know, you just can't have a guy in your bullpen getting lit up is what it amounts to. And the case here, none of those guys did. That's the, um, the Expos uh, stats. And we can go take a look. We're going to start with the American League stats of some players. Here is that MVP award awarded to Al Oliver. If you look at the top batting averages in the league, you can see Oscar Gamble is pretty close. One more homer, one less RBI, hitting 328. But the White Sox did not nearly go far enough. Here's Gary Carter. He could be MVP of the American League. A 333 hitting catcher with that much production. 
Uh, Matlock was your 1981 batting champion, so that follows that right there. Cooper, if it wasn't for George Brett 1980, he would have won the batting title. And there is Brett right there with that 1980 card. So you see Brett, only 18, 19 points below the 390 batting average. Not bad at all. Brian Downing carrying the California Angels. Probably should start seeing some Angels in here, like Baylor and Grit should be on this list somewhere. Here you have uh, teammates Molitor and Yount. And the Expos, I really thought they were going to go to the League Championship Series, but they faded against the Angels in the divisional round. Uh, any more? Let me see. Oh, here's the Tim Raines and the 32 stolen bases. Just kind of scrolling down see if there's a number that pops out to me. A lot, of, a lot of stolen bases. Henderson, Tomaso Garcia, Andre Dawson, either double-A AA or triple-A Steelers. Tony Armas had a big year. Uh, 37 RBI, 14 home runs. But a 2 day average. And is there any real straggling uh, batting averages here in, uh, in baseball? These guys here really hurt their teams. And let's go down to the American League pitching now. Here's your American League pitching stats. McGregor, uh, the number three starter, with the only ERA below two, but he only did in 51 innings. Uh, guys who were innings eaters and did that, 1980 Mike Norris. Probably should have been Cy Young the more I think about it. I uh, did it for an expansion team, which, you know, the you know, expansion teams aren't very good. Got the, got seven and two, two twenty-eight. You saw Steve Rogers with nine wins, but that includes playoffs. And uh, here's some other Oriole pitchers. This is why they almost cancel each other out for the Cy Young. Uh, oh, we gave it to oh we did look at that. We did give it to Steve Rogers. So there it is. So yeah, I did give it to Steve Rogers. I was feeling sentimental there. So there you go. Uh, the year of the Expos and the year of their players. Al Oliver and Steve Rogers. Cy Young, MVP, and world champions. It all just happened. It just coalesced all at once, really. And it's, it's not a fluke. The cards they're using from 79 to 82, baseball historians will look back and say, boy, that Expo, that Expo franchise was loaded. Um, same thing happened in 94, of course. Uh, the strike ruined their uh, chances. Um, Brian Guidry had a nice year there. Uh, there's some, uh, oh, there, there's, there's going to be a closer, uh, so this is, this isn't even the best one. It's very good though. Gossage, 23 innings, 14 saves, a buck 57 ERA out of the bullpen. Now, there'll be a better one in the National League coming up when we get over, over to that side. Team stats, sort of a batting average. This is the entire league, both, uh, added together. The Astros hit 301. And they were upset by Portland in the divisional round. That was kind of a shock. Um, a 301 hitting team, 145 RBI. Not high on the home run list, as you could imagine. High on the stolen base list. And then here you see that there's your Phillies and Expos, your World Series combatants. They could hit fourth and fifth best batting averages on the team. Look at the, the you know, when, once you get to a World Series, you have so many RBI because you're playing extra rounds. Here's our Reds, also over 200 RBIs. Number one seed in the National League, wasting uh, a year. Plus 55 Expos, 55 home runs. It's a ton. And we scroll down by average to see who's dragging up the bottom. And oh yeah, look at the Colorado Rockies. They're supposed to be hitting home runs. And the Orioles, how did the Orioles hit 236 and sabotage their chances? Before we do National League stats, let's do um, the sort by earned run average. And there you see the Orioles here with the league best 270 ERA. Yankees and Orioles, top two ERAs in the sport. But you got the Expos sitting there. Sixth? That's not bad. There's the Brewers. This is a real shocker. Look at these. These are probably my two favorite teams presently in this timeline. Brewers and Expos, very close. Brewers probably fell short in the power department a little bit. 
and they really shouldn't have, should have gotten by the Angels. And there are the Angels. Angels right beneath them. The Brewers could not beat them in the divisional round, but rather disappointing. Are there bad pitching staffs down here? Uh, Colorado Rockies. So, you know, you don't want to be this team and not get the first pick in the draft, which is the case. Seattle has the first pick in the draft. We have to look at the National League stats. We didn't do that yet, so we'll do that now. And over here, you see there wasn't a, anything that really jumps out to suggest MVP offhand. Um, you know, seven home runs for Ted Simmons, 30 some on RBIs for Keith Moreland. Um, seven home runs again. I mean, it's, 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 I mean, these are obviously good hit batting stats, but nothing jumps out to say, oh, that guy's the MVP. Bob Horner has 40 RBIs. It's nice. Probably leave the National League. You got eight homers here. You got nine homers for Winfield. 13, 14, 12 stolen bases. Lacey pulls to Daniel. Double digits and stolen bases. Yeah, and there's Schmidt. So there's 13 numbers and the 41 RBIs to pace the National League. And, you know, this slump, he slumped in the World Series. Otherwise, you know, it wouldn't look like he was unworthy of getting a MVP. It's almost like you go into the season before you start playing the games and Mike Schmidt's the MVP until proven otherwise with that 81 card. It's just a ridiculous card, if you, the 81 Mike Schmidt. George Paul started a nice year of production, not a batting average. Yeah, and with that, with that, we can, we can transition now to what we're up to as this year is now over and we're going into another year and um, when we do this, we have um, some sheets we've put together. Um, we'll look at this sheet first here. We have the um, rosters at the end of the year. And we've kind of already gone through this process. Um, so these are all the rosters at the end of the year. And each of the teams has to decide if they want to... Uh, the eight players who played in the year of 1979 have to vacate the league. So eight, you create, you create eight roster spots. But you have to decide that you want to keep four of your guys... Wave two of your guys and retire two of your guys. I just randomly popped up on the Detroit Tigers. And the cool thing about this math is if you, when you designate who you want to keep, you give them a value of $10,000. Um, let me find another example. If you find a guy you want to put on waivers, you give his value at $100. And when you retire a player, his value is a dollar. So every team has to get four two and two and, and four times um see if i have a perfect team here somewhere here's one the rangers were perfect before we started the process they saw four guys they wanted to keep they saw two guys that wanted to put on waivers they saw two guys that wanted to retire you add all this math up and it comes to this number here and why i did it this way is is that it allows me to see instantly four two and two which is eight, and that represents the eight players from 1979 are, are disappearing. You can also see here, this column happens to be the year we have the card in. So here, you see the 79, the 79, these three 79s, see how that works. So, and you get summations that are the same summation in that column year and year out. Anyway, what's interesting is that's how the all season starts. And then we have our postseason, we have our draft order, beginning with the worst team, Seattle. And this draft order is ordered by um, worst record for the eight um, uh, last place teams. But the leagues cannot have three guys, three teams in a row. 
So Seattle, Minnesota, the American League, then Colorado, San Diego, Boston, Florida, Detroit, and the Cubs. All finished in last place. And then you continue the order by winning percentage, making sure you don't have three teams in one league in a row. Then 17 through 20 are the teams that just missed out on the playoffs. And then 21 to 32 are, of course, your playoff teams, and there's the Expos at the bottom. So everybody has made a designation to how many do you want to keep, waive, or retire. And you see, remember I say you want 40202, okay? And the Texas had that, right, as well. Yeah, 40202. So you have to do a series of trades so that every team has 40202. And so we have a, a trade carousel, we call it, where every team is making trades at once to get to the math. And we have a series of trades to lead us to the draft. And if a trade is imbalanced, a team will add a token to the trade. Um, I can go through these here. This won't take too long. There wasn't a lot of trades. Um, Seattle has the first pick in the draft and they discovered that they have nobody on the horizon that looks <laughs> worthy of being the first pick in the draft. And it wasn't as if people were answering their calls. And then eventually the Chicago Cubs piped up and said, how about Dave Kingman? And Dave Kingman in 1979 had 48 home runs with the National League and homers. And his contract was up and the Seattle said, well, if that's the best guy we can get, <laughs> we'll get him. We'll get the home run king. Um, coming off, uh, 80's not a, a good year, but his stats are pretty good. But So this is the trade. It involved active players from the 1980, in, in, uh, indicated with this green color. And the rights, a keeper, is indicated in blue. So Julio Cruz was sent to the other Chicago team, in this case, not the White Sox, but the Cubs in this deal with a token being involved. And then some other players uh, found new homes. We sent Ken Lander to Toronto, Rick Wise to the Giants. I'm kind of going to go through these because there's not a lot of them. Don Hood goes back to the Indians. Here's the only other trait of significance, and it's kind of minor. Uh, how to get Nolan Ryan to Houston. So we, we made it uh, basically Nolan Ryan for Ken Forsh. And frankly, Forsh on the short part of the career is pretty good. It's only when Ryan extends this thing in the later part of the 80s is this considered a one-sided deal. But Ken Force is pretty darn good in the 80 and 81 era here. I think also through 83, it might be good. So uh, the Angels also uh, get a token for losing Nolan Ryan. And then the rest of the trades were all about accounting. And by accounting, it means that uh, a team has a guy on waivers and they need a retired player. So the two teams just make a, a handshake trade. No tokens are added because neither team gets an advantage because they don't want to keep either of these players. And these are a bunch of these that happened. Just a ton of these. And so really, uh, uh, Dave Roberts got moved back to Houston where he started his career. That's about it. So not a lot of player movement thus far in the off season of, of current cards. Just again, Nolan Ryan and Ken Forge here. And of course, basically getting Dave King, the rights of Dave Kingman to Seattle so they have somebody to draft number one. Which is a little bit disappointing, but um, that's what we've done in the... Um, and you see here, tokens each team starts as with five tokens, which are considered moves used during the draft. And it, uh, like Seattle lost a token because they, they got Kingman in that deal and the Cubs acquired one. So this is the grand total over here. And once the eight rounds of the draft is over, this becomes the, the order for undrafted free agency. The teams with the most tokens get first crack at undrafted players. That's how you can replace and swap out your backup catchers, utility infielders, corner outfielders, long men, uh, or even upgrade players that you haven't upgraded yet. So, um, pretty quiet offseason. Much quieter than in the other timeline. 
Uh, one of the reasons why it might be quiet is that there's more talent available on the streets because you've got 26 major league teams. And in the uh, fall uh, summer league that goes from 72 to 75, there's only 24 major league teams. So this league is flush with talent if you want to consider that. So there's often not a lot of off-season transactions. Every team also, these other two sheets, I'm going to scroll right back up to this sheet. We have all the eligible players for the four-year carrier league are stored in a sheet ready for the draft. And all the teams, starting at the very beginning with Arizona, uh, we have their 12 current players remaining from the 20 in the corresponding years of 80 to 82, with 83 being the new year. And we've also indicated the potential that a player could get improved here with all these teams. We know everybody's got a keeper. Speaking of Seattle, we know that their keepers, uh, any of these four guys could have been the first pick in the draft, Bruce Bakhti, Rupert Jones, Gaylord Perry, or Dave Kigman. Not exactly what you want to be doing in the years of 1980 to 83, but looks like Kingman. Look, this is kind of funny, but every once in a while in the NFL draft, the first overall pick is not a lock. Nobody knows who's going to be picked first overall. This is probably a bad year draft since Dave Kingman's going to go first overall. Um, but we also have our list of wavered players and indicated if any of these wavered players are any good. We highlight those to help speed up the draft process. And even a guy who is retired, of which means, yeah, he doesn't play baseball anymore, but there are guys here you see with some years. This means that they actually played baseball. We only made them retire because they weren't very good anymore. And if they did have to go into retirement because they didn't have a card in 1980, sometimes they come back in 81, 82, or 83 and have a decent year. Um, yeah, and you see 83, Roy Thomas, 82, Bruce Keeson, you know, some, some guys there. So we have, a, we have our way of putting our eyes on the whole league. All the guys who were retired, all the guys who put on waivers, everybody's individual teams, their list of keeper players, the present 12-man rosters, and if there are internal improvements. And then over here in the sheet, we have beginning alphabetically with Arizona. We have the same. We've got all the data, of course, here for... There are 12 current players. This light green area is those same 12 players with their stats in one of the other three years in consideration. If you wanted to upgrade a guy, you think these years are better, those stats are gonna be in this light green shaded area for Arizona. Let's go back to Arizona again here. They're keepers. Their keepers are Steve Dillard, Daryl Porter, Daryl Thomas, Mike Vale. And so right here, we have all those stats at our fingertips there. So we can make an evaluation of who we think is the is the player above of these keepers who might be their, their first pick in this draft. And if not that, then we'll show you a little bit here in a second, the rookies. We also have a guy listed on Arizona's retired report and their wavered report. And if you look here, it's 58 rows in, so Arizona has 58 players covered with a current protection, wave, retire, alternate cards, and basically all teams have a, a very a number a variant number like that. I can page down alphabetically by team here, so we get to Toronto to the next group of players. And you see we're getting close to 1,800 players here. 1,887 players out of a possible uh, uh, 2,600 and uh, 2,560. 2,560 is the 640 players times four. So you have 1,887 guys are in some type of control or under the radar of Major League Baseball teams. Then you have this first group of players 
all playing in the year of 1980, who are just sitting out there on the street waiting to get a call. They haven't been drafted yet, including some nice players like Jim Dwyer, uh, Dan Graham, Rick Peters, Barry Bunnell, Terry Whitfield. So there's some decent players here have not been taken yet in the draft. Hitters, then pitchers, you got Frank LaCorte, Don Robinson, Rich Gale, some nice pitchers there, have not been in the league yet with their 1980 cards. Then 1981, same thing. You have um, uh, Paul Householder has a decent year, 787 OPS, Yvonne Hayes, Pat Putnam, hitters, and then pitchers here, Andy Rincon, Dave Rosema, Mike Scott. And then you have 1982. The 1982 players have protection for the first four of the eight rounds of the draft for guys who were on your rookie list a year ago that you didn't take. So again, let's use the example of Arizona. Since we said Arizona, are they going to take Steve Diller, Daryl Porter, Daryl Thomas, Mike Vale first? They could also do they want to go with Bobby Brown, Mel Hall, Jeff Lottie, Mike Scott, Jerry Turner, or Ed Vandenberg. Um, now, remember, this is the second year. We looked at all these cards last year, and they didn't get into the league last year. If you pass on these guys again, after the fourth round, they become part of the general population, and anybody can take them. So you lose your protection. The final year, 83, uh, let's look at Arizona again. Here we go. Uh, and so in 1983, Arizona's... Now, this is rookies. This is the first time we've seen these cards in the league, and some of the names might maybe be the same. Bob Brenly, Mel Hall, Dave Henderson, Andy McGaffigan, Mike Scott, Rick Steyer, and Ed Vandenberg. So some of these, so sometimes it's the same player, with a, and you pick a better card. Uh, in the case here, I'm looking over at batting average in this column, and nothing looks particular other than Mel Hall has an 840 OPS in 1983. That's not bad. And the pitchers, looks like Andy McGaffigan's got a nice year. No, no, actually no. Ed Vandenberg. But anyway, those are all the rookies of 83. And then there's one other group of players that are uh, vacated from the draft, and those are the cards that are handwritten into a league uh, from, from a, the individual season draft to get to 640 players because normally you don't get that quantity of players in the Stratomatic sets, so I have to hand write in nameless cards. But I don't like to play these nameless cards, so I just keep a record of them at the back end of the draft. And then we do that. The final number here, it's actually 2563, we added three cards because we had extras. 2563, so that's uh, 640 times four is 2560, and with three more makes 2563. That's how many cards are eligible for a draft. And then the draft over here, <laughs> we've, uh, usually the first pick of the draft is known before I finish putting the draft uh, spreadsheet together. So it looks like, yeah, Dave Kingman is gonna be the first pick of Seattle. Uh, with 850 OPS, really crushes right-handed pitching in 1980, though. And he's got an outstanding 1984. And he'll be playing in the Kingdom. So he'll be the first big basher to go to the Kingdom there. That, that could be fun. I think that's what we're, we're going to do that as a wrap for the end of the 1979-82 season review. And then uh, we'll pick this up in the, in the future for the 1980-83 to 83 Fall League. Uh, that'll begin, of course, in the fall of 2024, in October or so. We'll have draft results for that. In the meantime, we're going to start uh, switching over to our Summer League draft. We have a little winter baseball tournament of 72 cards called the Winter Baseball Classic. That runs through February and March. And then, of course, the 1972-75 draft in uh, mid-March and the, the league begins. So it runs from March through Labor Day and the, the broadcasts continue all the way through October. So that's the schedule. Thanks for following along with this, folks. I appreciate it and uh, we'll see you soon.